but so, so I've been interested in the stock market um, for, for quite a while. And um, this, is a, this, this, this plot doesn't immediately have anything to do with the stock market, but this is something that, that, that came from another government database. And I've showed the NOAA data, showed NASA data. Our government does an unbelievable job of making data available to the public. Um, the resources that are out there for free are staggering. And that is one of our, I think, great accomplishments as a nation that we're doing that. So this right here, this looks like the standard population density map of the United States. What this actually is, is this is the FCC database of antennas. Um, and it follows where the people are, right? So this is mostly cell phone antennas here. And so, you know, there's lots of cell phone antennas in the Bay Area, not very many in central Nevada and so forth. Now this, this map on the right is the number of new, it shows the new licensed radio links in the past 24 months. Um, and so instead of individual points, what these actually are are little line segments from one spot to another, making direct microwave radio communications or 80 gigahertz radio communications. And resolution is not good, but it doesn't have to be. You see something there. There's a triangle. In fact, it's, it's not quite a 345 triangle, which would have been cool, but it's, <laughs> there's a triangle. And so what's going on here? It's kind of interesting, right? There, there are microwave links that are connecting three points in the United States, right? So again, Google Earth, free, download it, hook it up to the FCC database. And when you do that, oh, but, sorry, before, before I go to the Google, um, let me just zoom in on these, these, these links between the Chicago area and the New York area. So these are, turns out that, that these links are indeed routes that run, microwave routes that run from Chicago, near Chicago to near New York. And they have some sort of interesting names, like thought transmissions. <laughs> right? And so if you go and you try to find out stuff about thought transmissions, you can't find anything about it. It's a shell company of some sort. And there's core links and high voltage communications and TRF services and MVC research and Zen networks down here. And these have been appearing in the FCC database. And um, as time goes on, they have been getting closer and closer and closer to the great circle that connects Chicago and New York. In fact, uh, Jefferson Microwave is a mere nine kilometers longer than the perfect geodesic between Chicago and New York. So you can interesting, like, where exactly are these microwave networks originating from? So here's the Chicago area. And you might think, oh, they've got to be coming from, uh, from the Chicago Board of Trade or something like that, you know, downtown. Um, no, they're, they're coming from the center of this, 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 this Google map here. And in fact, they're coming right across, um, this right here is, is, is Fermilab, right there, that's the accelerator, that's the circle. They're coming from right there. And so if you go in to Google Earth and look at where they're coming from, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, 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 sorry, okay, so um, this is where they're coming from. So these are, these, are the, these are the towers in suburban Chicago where these microwave networks are emerging from. And you can see there's some big dishes on some of those towers, like this one right here has a 12-foot dish up, up near the top. And they're right next to this strange building. And you can see that this is a strange building because it has a whole lot of power coming into it right there, and there's all sorts of high-tension wires coming in. It's completely blank slate of a building, painted, painted white for heat um, issues. And this is what it looks like on Google Maps, it's totally anonymous. And then this is where the microwave networks are ending on the other side. They come into a place in New Jersey. And if you go to Google Maps, this is that spot. This is I-95, and the place where the microwave networks are coming in is just behind this truck right here. Uh, so there's something interesting going on. <laughs> and it's all just fooling around with the FCC database and Google Earth. 
So what I also did is I got some stock market data. And it turns out that what's going on here is that the E-mini futures, the S&P S, S 500 futures, which trade in Chicago, have an effect on what happens in New York. And if you're the first person to know that effect, then you can make money. And so what you can do effectively, the way you make the money is you predict what ha is going to happen. You know what is going to happen. And so um, using this, it takes four milliseconds for the signal to go from Chicago to New York. Nothing happens until that signal reaches uh, uh, New York. And then there's a huge response in all the stocks in the SP 500. And that response lasts for 25, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds before it dies out completely into noise. And so we're seeing the same phenomena that we saw with the weather and with the Pythagorean three-body problem in that the information travel time across the system, the sort of characteristic time for this system is the speed of light connecting New York and Chicago. And on that time scale, which is four milliseconds, you can predict the future for some tens of milliseconds going forward. Now, I know that it's possible to, I mean, I can't do it, but you can make money on the stock market by saying, oh, Google's going to go up and Apple's going to You can do that. That is akin to making long-term climate predictions, right? What you cannot do is you cannot say that Google is going to trade at $657.02 at 254 in the afternoon Eastern time four weeks from now, right? That's a nonsense prediction. You can say, well, you know, these large-scale trends, Google's going to be higher than it is now. You may have that information. In the same way, you can say, we're putting carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to be warmer. Right? You can make that kind of prediction with the Earth system, but you can't make a specific prediction of what the weather will exactly be four weeks from now. You can't predict the high temperature exactly four weeks from now. Or better yet, the difference between the high temperature and the average high temperature on a day four weeks from now. So that's sort of the same phenomenon working on the millisecond time scale. And that brings us back to this problem of the solar system, which is in the completely opposite end. We know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. We know that the Earth is continuing to go around the sun next year. Uh, we know that the Earth has been going around the sun for 4.5 billion years. And so the question is, is how long will the planets last in their orbits? Um, and so this is a problem that you have to compute numerically. Um, you have to, in the same way that I numerically computed the solution for that three-body problem, you have to take the planets, you have to put them in a computer, you have to march them forward using Newton's laws, a sort of high-powered form of, of effective form of Newton's laws, and um, see where they'll be. And so this started, I mean, it, it has its antecedents all the way back in um, the age of clockwork. This is a, an orrery, is a device that's sort of a large clock that shows where the planets will be. Or you have watches that, that, that do this. A watch can make predictions using clockwork. And so this was, I took this at the Paris Observatory. There's these beautiful, beautiful machines machined out of brass, just exquisite things. Um, by the 1980s, these clockwork devices were ancient history, and special com purpose computers started to um, come into play. And over, over the last 20 years or so, 15, 20 years, computers have gotten fast enough so that um, you can make integrations of the solar system. You can predict where the solar system is going to be billions of years into the future. Or at least you can make a possible pr trajectory billions of years into the future. Um, it turns out that in the case of the solar system, the effective information transmission is the time scale that it takes for the planetary orbits to breathe in and out. And that time scale is a few million years. If you're familiar with um, um, nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory, um, what they say is that the Lyapunov time scale for the solar system is five million years. So what that means is that if you're uncertain as to where the positions of the planets are to 10 centimeters right now. We, we, we have an incredible grasp on where the planets are right now. We know where Mars is to within 10 centimeters. That, that's, that's perhaps the most mind-blowing thing that I've pointed out tonight. We have this incredible knowledge of the solar system ephemeris. But that knowledge 
steadily degrades over time. So five million years from now, um, we can predict the pr position of Mars, um, if we knew everything else to within 10 centimeters, to within a factor of, uh, say, 27 centimeters. And then five million years after that, it's 27 squared centimeters. So it sounds like, oh, we've, we've got it nailed. But it turns out that because of this exponentiation, because you're squaring and squaring and squaring, um, you can't predict the future for the solar system beyond about 120 million years. That's as far out as you can go. Solar system is four and a half billion years old, and the sun is going to last for another six billion years before it really starts to give the solar system problems. So what that means is there's a stretch of time longer than 120 million years where we cannot predict with certainty where the planets are going to be. We can't predict whether New Year's Day, AD 150 million, will be in the summer or in the winter. We, we, we can't predict that. Um, and we actually can't predict whether the Earth will be in the solar system at all at that point. Although there's, I'm going to show you there's an excellent chance that it will be. So um, <laughs> computers are fast. Computers are very fast. Um, one of my students, an undergraduate student, um, used his laptop, laptop just like this one, um, and he computed the evolution of the solar system for a total of 20 billion years into the future. And this is a bit of kind of a, uh, an, an academic exercise because the sun will turn into a red giant and probably, not for sure, but probably engulf the earth about six or seven billion years from now. Um, but if that doesn't happen, if the sun were, if it could kind of keep a lid on it and keep it from evolving, um, then it looks like the earth in this particular integration is stable for tens of billions of years. Turns out though that Mercury, the innermost planet, is not quite so stable. And Mercury, what I'm plotting here is the eccentricity of the orbit. That is how squashed the orbit is, how, how much of an ellipse, um, how eccentric the ellipse is. Mercury kind of runs into interesting problems where its orbit becomes fairly elongated. And so the question is, is if you could do these calculations for a long period of time, um, how long would it take before there was a serious disaster? Um, in 1989, or actually, sorry, 1992, it wasn't possible to do these long-term integrations. But there was a, a scientist in France, uh, Jacques Lascar, who wrote a very, very beautiful and intricate program which could make an approximate solution for the solar system's motion. And what he did, he fully understood this sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So, Instead of doing one integration of the solar system, he, he started out with four. Integrated four copies of the solar system, just changed the initial conditions ever so slightly. They start out exactly the same, just like the three-body problem that I was showing, and they diverge over time. And when he had computed for 50 million years or so, he would go back and he would see which one got the highest eccentricity for Mercury's orbit, which one had Mercury sort of in the most elongated state. And he would go to that exact point. And he'd take a copy and make four versions of that with very, very tiny changes to the initial conditions and integrate again. And then he'd look at those four and he'd find the one where Mercury got to highest eccentricity, take those and start from those. So he found a trajectory for the solar system that's completely, completely fine, completely consistent with our knowledge of the initial conditions in which Mercury goes unstable. So he showed that it's possible for the solar system to come undone. It's possible for Mercury's orbit to cross Venus's orbit and for a collision to occur. But what wasn't clear, it wasn't clear um, what that meant in the sense that it wasn't clear how long it would take if you just had one single integration before you saw this phenomenon because you were specifically kind of showing it towards the door. Um, computers have gotten so fast now that um, this problem has been solved through numerical brute force. Um, and the answer, interestingly enough, is that the solar system has a 99% chance of surviving until the sun turns into a red giant. And it has a 1% chance of going unstable. Um, and amazing, and so what's, what's, what happens here is that it turns out that Mercury, which we know is sort of the least stable planet in the solar system, um, it's kind of the easiest to affect. 
And what can happen is, is that the rate at which Mercury's orbit, not the planet, but the orbit itself processes, um, can get caught up in the same precession rate that Jupiter has. And Mercury can effectively random walk into a state where its precession rate matches that of Jupiter's. And when Mercury's precession matches that of Jupiter's, then in an average sense, um, Jupiter exerts what we call torque on Mercury's orbit. And that causes it to lose angular momentum, and Mercury's orbit becomes more and more eccentric and eventually crosses Venus's orbit, and a disaster will, will unfold. And you, know, you might think, well, that's, that's too bad for Mercury, but it's, it would be too bad for us as well, because if you destabilize Venus's orbit with a collision with Mercury, Venus starts to breathe in and out in terms of its orbit, and Mars and Earth start to interact. And um, it's been shown that Mars and Earth can have a direct uh, a collision. It's not likely, but it's, it's, it's completely possible. And interestingly, if you don't have the tiny corrections that are provided by general relativity, then these odds go up to more like 60 or 70 percent. So our solar system is stabilized. Mercury's orbit is stabilized by the slight adjustments to Newton's laws that are, are required by general relativity. Um, just to kind of show you what would happen, this is a simulation of Mars striking the Earth. Um, it's just not a good deal. Um, <laughs> the Mars would get completely destroyed and the Earth would be completely completely melted and partially destroyed by a collision with a Mars-side object. And in fact, the Earth did experience a collision with a Mars-side object. About probably 10, 20 million years after the Earth's formation, it collided with a Mars-sized planet, and that led to the formation of our moon. Our inner solar system started out with five terrestrial planets, and now it only has four. But it's been very stable since then. So it's interesting. I can just sort of leave with the same um, picture that I started out with you by observing the natural world and looking for patterns, looking for correlations in data, you can, using the laws of physics, you can kind of intuit some very interesting things. So I hope that, that you've enjoyed this sort of like excursion through a few different problems. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.